So if that test is passed, then we check the depth. If the puck position Z is less than paddle position Z minus 10 and puck position Z is greater than paddle position plus 20, um, so we're, we're checking to see if, if we're kind of in the zone of where the paddle is. And one more thing, we're also making sure that the puck velocity is coming towards us. Because you know, right now we're basically saying we only have a paddle collision if the puck is coming towards us. If it's going away from us, we don't collide. So if all those things are true, and we know that we were already within the bounds in the X direction, then we're in the bounds. The puck has hit the paddle. Our two if statements are doing the job of detecting collision, and now we need to, to, to do collision resolution. What is our collision resolution? These three lines of code. First things first, we turn the puck from going towards us to going away from us by doing puck velocity z times equal negative one, which flips the sign of the value. But you multiply by negative one, you flip the sign. Next step, we're saying paddle velocity equals paddle position minus paddle position last. All that's doing, of course, is we keep the last position of the paddle and now we're figuring out how fast we're moving the paddle based on the current and last position. Why do we need how fast we're moving? Because of this line. Puck velocity is being added to by paddle velocity times 1.5. In other words, how fast we push the puck, the, sorry, the paddle forward changes how fast the, uh, the puck moves. So that's the sum total of the puck and the paddle colliding. And then as a very last thing we do in our update function is we take paddle position last and make it equal to paddle position. So, um, and that, that's it. That's all we're doing for update. Uh, like I said, we're going to get back to this business of how the puck moves and collides against the walls after we look at the draw function. All right, so here we see the draw function, or at least the start of it. And the first thing we do is clear the graphics device, clear the screen to then we create a, a, a local matrix variable, and we're going to reuse this matrix every time we draw something. Why? Because remember, we've got the three matrices, our object, camera, and view matrices. And now it's time to get that object matrix working. Now, we already have a white cube. That's our box model. Box model, if you actually go back and look at it in a 3D editor, is a, is a cube perfect cube, it's centered around 0, 0, 0. We have applied a white texture to it, and the dimensions of the cube are 50, which is to say um, it's 100 in every dimension, and it's centered around 0, which means that every wall is 50 or negative 50, if you see what I'm saying. So the, the box itself is 100 by 100 by 100. And since it's centered around zero, that doesn't mean it goes from zero to 100. It means it goes from negative 50 to positive 50. And this is really important for us understanding how we put the table together and how we do collision detection. We've got to keep it straight because what we're doing here is taking that same box, which is you know 50 to negative 50 on, in every dimension, that is 100 by 100 by 100, and we're drawing it several times, but we're scaling in the different dimensions to make not only the table but also the four edges of the air hockey table that the puck is supposed to bounce off of, right? So we're going to look at this code and it's going to be mostly drawing the box model over and over again with different shapes, that is different scalings to make it draw different lengths and widths of box. We're also going to be drawing the cylinder model once, which is the puck, and we're going to be drawing the, uh, the box model two, which is the, uh, the paddle. And all of these models are still, I believe, you know, 100 wide. They're just you know, boxes except for the cylinder, which is a cylinder, but other than that, it's basically the same size. And all we're doing is scaling and positioning them, which is what our world matrix is supposed to do for us. So what's the first thing we do in this code after creating a matrix that we can reuse? We're actually going to draw the table base as the 
uh, as the comment says. We're going to make a matrix and we're going to make it with a create scale function call and a create translation function call. What's translation? It's movement. It's position. It's not rotating and it's not scaling. It's location. Right? So our create translation basically says 0, comma, negative 50, comma 0. That just takes the box and moves it downward in the y direction by 50, right? So we already knew the box was from positive 50 to negative 50, so if we go down by 50, what do we get? Now the box is from 0 to negative 100, which is okay. What we're trying to do here is set up a table where the, uh, the top of the table is the flat plane of the game we're playing. And the flat plane has, and the game has a y equal to zero, so the game should take place on top of the table, because the table's top is at zero. So we move the box down, but now we're also creating a scaling matrix. And what are we doing here? Well, in the y direction, we're scaling it by one, which means we're not scaling it at all. That's all the, these scaling values are multiplication, so the box is not changing its y. But in its, in its x direction, we're scaling it by two, and in z direction we're scaling it by 4. This tells us a few things. First off, our table is going to be 200 wide. And it's going to be 400 long. It's going to be twice as long as it is wide. Why, you know, how did we come up with these ideas? It's just here in the code. If we wanted to make a table that's extra long, or a table that's extra wide, then this is exactly where we would change the numbers. And notice, that when we're creating this matrix, we're actually creating two matrices, a, a translation matrix and a, uh, and a scaling matrix. And then we multiply them together, which from the matrix's point of view is like concatenating them or adding them together, taking the two and making them one that does the same thing as the two would separately. We're, we're multiplying them together, which you know is what you do when you take two matrices and take them, put them together so they're actually just one doing the same thing. So in this case, we've got our, our table base, and we move it down, and then we scale it so that it's 200 wide, 400 long. Still centered around zero. Let's keep in mind that the very center of the table is now zero comma zero comma zero, at least the center of the table, top of the table, where our game is going to happen. Now that we've drawn that table, that's great, we've got a table. But we need edges, we need those bumpers, those raised bumpers on the four sides of the table. And this is what we're doing now. So draw a back edge. So what's the back? It's the, the, the edge farthest from our camera. It's in the negative Z direction. So if you look at this, the first thing we do is create translation 0, 0, negative 200. So we're taking the box, which is 100 by 100, and we're pushing it away from us 200 so that it goes to the far edge. And the next thing we're doing is scaling it. We scale it in the x direction to drag it, you know, two. That means it's as wide as the table itself. And then in the y direction, we're scaling it by 0.2. Remember, it, it's a total of 100, so if we scale by 0.2, that's dividing it by 5, which means that it's now 20. And then we're scaling it by 0.1 in the z direction, and that scaling by 0.1 in the z direction starts out being 100, so now it's 10. So it's 10 z, 20 y, and 200 x. That's the bar that goes along the back side of the table. Obviously, the box is no longer cubicle, right? But the box is still cubicle. We haven't actually changed any of our data. So that's how we create the back edge. And of course, we've got four edges to the table. So we're going to do the front edge, which basically is just the same as the back edge, except towards us instead of away from us. And then right edge and left edge. And again, we're taking this perfect cube, this white cube, and we're first positioning it to where we want it to go, to the centering it on something, and then we scale it so that it becomes not a cube anymore. It becomes a long side runner or a long back runner or the base of the table. So look, five draw calls using exactly the same mesh but scaling it in different ways makes our table.
And this is, in the larger sense, uh, indicative of how we make 3D in games. We build primitives into something complex. Primitives like cubes and pyramids and spheres. Uh, remember that these are 3D objects, not 2D objects that we're normally making 3D complicated objects out of. But they're still considered so-called primitives. And in fact, fundamentally, when you're doing 3D, you never get away from that. Even if you're just doing collisions, you do you collision against you collide against cylinders or spheres or boxes or whatever, and you will always do that in 3D. So the idea of primitives and how we build complex scenes out of primitives is fundamental to how we make 3D games. So now that we've done those five draw calls that just make the table, now we have another couple draws. We draw the puck and we draw the paddle. Now notice that our puck is being drawn with a scaling value of 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1. So we scaled it to one-tenth, which is fine. I'm sure we started out as a 100 wide uh, cylinder. And if this piece of code teaches you that every 3D object that you load up could be in one size or the other, and then you just automatically scale it to whatever size you want it to be, then that's partially right. You, know, you, you as the programmer are free to load up a 3D mesh and then scale it however you want. Make it big, make it small, whatever. It actually is you know, basically a free operation. On the other hand, uh, working closely with an artist, you'll find that it, it pays to work out a uh, scale, a, a frame of reference, uh, whether you're using feet or inches or meters or miles. Uh, this is something that you work out with your artist just to make life easier for both of you. But at the end of the day, no matter what your artist gives you, you're still free to make it smaller or bigger. That's never scary or hard when it comes to 3D programming. All right, so we've drawn the five pieces of the table and the puck and the paddle. Boom, we're done. That's all we need to do in terms of drawing. And remember that our table, at least you know, the, the fundamental shape of our table is 200 wide, 400 long. And we've got four edges. And if you look again at the edges, our edges basically are 10 wide. And they're centered on the very edge of the table. Which kind of means that the difference between the edge of the table and how far in the borders of our table go, the, 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 the raised uh, bumpers of our table, is actually five. You know, it may, it may take a while for you to scratch your head and go, is that what the math says? But it's important, especially because we've got to go back and actually make the puck realistically collide with the edge of the table. Before we go back through that, though, I wanted to show you something. We made this draw mesh function, which just takes the incantation of how you draw 3D meshes using DirectX and XNA. And as you see here, I just wrap it up into a function called draw mesh which takes the argument of the mesh, or sorry, the model, and the world matrix. Now it already uses the camera matrix and the projection matrix that we've created elsewhere and puts them all in the proper places and calls mesh.draw and boom, we're done. That's why um, our draw uh, function looks actually so simple and streamlined. We're gonna go back to the part of the code in our update function where we deal with the collision detection and resolution of our puck against the sides of our table. We start with these two very important calculations, the x limit and the z limit. These are, remember that the, the table is centered around zero, so it could go 100 in this way and negative 100 in that way. That's what our limit's going to be. It's going to be how far from the zero, the center of the table, we can get in our various dimensions. Remember, we're not worrying about y at all because everything takes place on the y plane for this game. So x limit says 50 times 2, that's 100, and that makes sense because our table is now 200 wide. All right? But it also subtracts something. It says 50 times 0.2. So 50 times 0.2 is, is 10. So why did, we sub why did we go out to the edge of the table and then subtract 10, get 10 in? Well, remember we've already said that the edge of the table 
is 10 wide and centered on the edge of the table. The, 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 the mumper of the table is 10 wide centered on the edge of the table, which means it actually sticks back out into the table five, right? On top of that, our disc, our cylinder that makes our puck is normally 100 wide and we multiplied it when we drew it, when we drew it the, by, uh, by 0.1, which means we got it down to 10 across, which again means that um, it's, you know, the, the difference between the center of the puck and its outside edge is going to be 5. So 5 plus 5 equals 10. 50 times 0.2 is 10. There we go. This is, this is our calculation to figure out how far our puck can go before visibly the puck seems to be connecting with the edge of the table. And in this case it means that it's 100 but subtract 10. 5 for the width of the puck, or sorry, the diameter of the puck, and 5 for the diameter of the bumper on each edge of the table. Okay, so we've got all that going for us, and of course we've calculated the Z limit as being 200 instead of 100. So now we've got the X limit and the Z limit. These are as far in those directions as our puck can go before it touches the side of the table. This is our calculation. And by the way, bounce energy loss is just what we use to figure out how much slower the puck goes after it bounces off the table. Now that we know these things, the rest of the code is a little bit more understandable. We say, if puck position X is greater than X limit, as we've gone beyond the bounds of X, and we've done it in the positive direction, and puck velocity.x is greater than zero. In other words, we're going in the right direction and we have exceeded the bounds in the right direction. Then it's time to, to then we've collided. We, we're going in this direction and we've gone far enough, we've collided. So it's time to do collision resolution on this edge, which means we're gonna turn it around and we're gonna slow it down a little bit. So this is what this code does. We multiply the velocity x by negative one and then it says the total velocity is multiplied by bounce energy loss, which means that we lose one, uh, uh, 0.1 or 10%. So, and we're just doing that for all four edges. And notice that we're not actually doing this calculation relative to the geometry of the table, because the geometry is a lie. We're just taking a 100 cubic, 100 by 100 by 100 white cube, and we're stretching it around to build the table out of these stretched parts. It has nothing to do with actual geometry that we could collide against. And in much more complicated games, we would have landscape or geometry that we would collide against. But even so, this is a very important lesson that the, 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 the 3D data that we display on the screen is very often, in fact, much more often not, than not has nothing to do with the collision data that causes our car or our person or our shots to bounce off. It's part of why I keep jokingly saying that making 3D games is a giant lie. In this case, what it means is that we're just getting the right numbers for how far the puck can go, and when the puck exceeds that and is going in the correct direction, we decide that there's been a bounce, and we do the bounce. We turn it around, and we slow it down. Okay, there we go. We have now looked at all the code for this particular project. And when you sit back and, and think about it, it's, it's pretty simple. We've got a pretty complex update, but there's only one moving part. Um, well, there's two moving parts, but there's only one basic you know, puck that bounces around. And then there's one paddle which interacts, and the puck interacts with the paddle, and the puck interacts with the four sides of the game, and that's it. That's, it. that's all we're doing in this. So there, we could do theoretically a lot more, but you know, for now, it's pretty simple, and uh, nowhere to go but up. So let's talk about the things that we can do to make this game more and better than it is. I have lots of great ideas. Uh, that we can go through together. Number one, 
obviously change the background color. Why not? We, we know how to change background colors. It's trivia. Number two, use the keyboard to move the paddle around. We've used the keyboard to as input before. It shouldn't be all that hard. Um, and right now we're just using the mouse to position the paddle, but we could easily read the keyboards, the keyboard and adjust the paddle position on the X and Z planes. Number three, if you notice something, we're, our table's kind of ugly. And the reason for that is because the, we're just building the table out of stretched cubes. And we're not even being careful. Specifically, the, the corners of the table look really, you know, they don't, they don't match, they don't meet, they look kind of clumsy and unfinished. So it'd be nice if we fixed that. It might be nice if we adjusted the scaling of those, uh, of those corner uh, draws so that the corners met nicely and we had a nice looking table looked a little bit more professional. If you notice, we've got a 3D space around the table that's completely empty. And that's kind of weird. The table is floating in nothingness, light blue nothingness. Why don't we change that? Wouldn't it be nice if we could go into our 3D editor, our 3D um, mesh creator, and build a room for the air hockey table? Maybe with a back wall, maybe something nice. Now, if you do choose to do that, if you do choose to make a 3D room that is drawn around and fits with the table, uh, then I really don't want to see it even a little bit of that, that blue world behind it. Make sure that it covers, it's enough of a space so it, it uh, the, the camera sees nothing but the room and the table. And the table itself is white. That's pretty boring. But you know, we've seen air hockey tables before and they're actually really cool and they have cool designs. So why don't you change the texture on the air hockey table so that it looks really cool. Here's a trickier one. Let's make a, another paddle on the opposite side of the table that's controlled by another human player, maybe with another set of keys, or you know, maybe player one's mouse and player two is keyboard. Uh, but it's another human that can also move the paddle, and that paddle also interacts with the puck. All right, and here's a little more, also a more challenging one. Let's put a notch on the far and near ends of the table as goals, because normal air hockey tables actually have goal areas where the, the puck can pass through to score a goal. So I want to see a notch, a, a graphical notch, so that you can see the puck can go through there. And I also want to see the puck go through there. And I want, once the puck goes through there, reset it. Put it back on the table so you can play again. So here's a really tough one. Make an opposing paddle, like I already said, but make this one controlled by the AI. Make an AI for that paddle that can actually win a game by making the puck go through the proper goal. So it'd also be nice to see uh, a 2D score. You could draw a 2D score on the screen. You've done that before. And let's improve the camera. Right now it's pretty dumb. It just sits there looking at the puck. I'll bet that a nicer camera would work more interestingly or maybe track differently. But you know, don't try to make a camera bad just for the sake of it, but make it different. So also try maybe changing the width and height of the play, f I mean the width and length of the play field. You know, it doesn't have to be exactly 200 by 400, it could be anything you want, but you know what, if you adjust the graphical width and length of the table, you're going to also going to have to adjust the, the collision code. So here's a real challenge. Uh, we already have a, a, uh, a paddle, maybe two paddles, that the puck can bounce off of. How about you also put a couple of unmoving blocks in the middle of the play field that the puck can bounce off of? That'd be a more challenging play field. If you really want to go crazy and do something a little more different, you know, the fact is you have a, a rectangular space in 2D, uh, it would drew it in 3D, but the game is 2D, and you have a, a paddle on the, along the bottom and you have the puck moving around and it's bouncing off of square things, why not break out? How hard could it be to actually add extra blocks in there that the puck can bounce off against and then when the puck bounces off them they disappear? That's the very definition of a breakout game. Make a breakout game with at least 10 blocks. That, that would be an interesting challenge. And now, in terms of sound effects, it'd be nice if we had a sound effect for when the paddle and the block and the, the puck meet, and a different sound effect for when the puck hits the wall. That'd be nice. So there it is. That's the, our, our, our air hockey table 3D, 2D game. It teaches us about the 
rudimentary aspects of how we collide and how we locate things in 3D space. It lets us use our matrices. Uh, it it uh, helps us understand about drawing things and how we're drawing meshes using matrices to transform them. Transform them tr by translating them, that is moving them around in space, scaling them, making them bigger or smaller, and uh, rotating them. Uh, there's also some esoteric ways you can use matrices. So matrices do a whole lot of possible transformations, but we can keep it simple by remembering that we can have one matrix for moving, one matrix for scaling, one matrix for rotating. You multiply them all together, you got it all done in one matrix. Okay, thanks for watching. Have fun programming.